Joel Embiid um, ended, ended the game with an injury, and he also finally put an end to his scoring streak of scoring 30 points consecutively over 22 games. That's how much he held it for. The only other player that had more consecutive games with 30 points was Wilt. Obviously, like, no one is going to be able to, it's very difficult to break any of Wilt's scoring records because, you know, he's just a, he's a freak of nature. So, obviously, like, this is really impressive, even though he's not the first. Uh, he left the game with four minutes left in the fourth with what appears to be a hyperextended knee. And since he's already missed 12 games this season, um, we don't know, like, how severe, we still don't know how severe this injury really is. Because like the the official report like it hasn't come out yet. That's only that's only what it looks like. It looks hyperextended, but we don't know for sure. And with Joel Embiid missing twelve games already uh, this season, um, he has a chance, or there's a possibility of him not meeting the criteria for being the MVP. And therefore, like for now, I believe he has about ten or twelve days in order to recover before he reaches that 65 game threshold. And once he goes below that, he can't win the MVP. Therefore, Jokic, Shai, and Giannis are going to be your top three um, in the MVP voting for this year. I think the award right now, it looks like it's going to go to Jokic by default. Um, assuming that like Joel Embiid doesn't come back, um, assuming Joel Embiid doesn't come back from his injury early, I think this award is going to go to Jokic. Uh, Shai does have a case, even though, even in the games where they lose, uh, he tends to show up and he's always been consistent. So there's a chance that he might end up overcoming Jokic in that sense. There's also a chance that Giannis will also be doing the same thing. I'll get to that a little bit later. Let's talk about, um, let's, let's talk about Joel Embiid. Now before I, before I rip on him a little bit, let's, let's see what the, let's talk about the winner side. Of, of this game. So this was a much needed win for Golden State after their recent loss to the Lakers in double overtime. Uh, Curry played great with 37 points on 12 of 17. So did Andrew Wiggins going 8 for 10 with 23 points and Jonathan Kaminga also ended with 26. Obviously these star players did their part in helping the, this team get a win. There are two games below Houston uh, he was, who is uh, right below the play-in tournament. So beating a good team like Philly with Joel is definitely a, a confidence booster. Now, they, Joel Embiid might have looked injured like throughout the entire game, but still, like Joel Embiid is their best player. So beating them with their best player is still a confidence booster. And you really have to give credit to um, like while Steph Curry and like the others that I mentioned before, they played a great offensive game. You also have to give credit for. Uh, Draymond and Steve Kerr and the great job that they did in the matchup um, with Joel Embiid. Uh, Draymond Green, like I mentioned before, like how a lot of people don't really like Draymond Green because of his play style and because of how dirty he is, but it is games like this that like sort of define him. Like Joel Embiid was held to 14 points on 5 of 18 with 8 turnovers and the worst plus minus in the game. So as the haters always say, he's always he's in playoff mode already. <laughs> uh, this is this isn't uh, this isn't new for Draymond, however, doing these type of things to dominant centers. Uh, he does this type of thing all the times, so all of them. And well, I can't really say all the time because there are times where the offense is better than the defense. But most of the time, Draymond plays elite defense against a lot of great um, a lot of great centers, and this is why the Warriors have him on this roster. It, this game literally showed why, like, his value. He had the second highest uh, box plus minus in this game um, with 18, even though he was 3 of 8 from the field with 9 points, 6 rebounds, and 6 assists. Like, those stats don't sound like positive box plus minus stats, but he gets, the, he gets box plus minuses like these all the time while putting up... Um, mediocre numbers like this and the two players like above him the same as him or like the same as him Kaminga and Curry were the two best scorers in the starting lineup so it took he was tied with one with the second best score on his team with box plus minus like that really shows his value that he brings to the team offensively and the value that he brings not not offensively defensively and the value that he brings on like playmaking on the offensive side of the ball that's what i meant by offensively i had to make sure that like he's, he's not really scoring the ball don't 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 ever think i think don't ever catch me saying that he's a good scorer um if and the argument might have been like 
uh, oh, how many free throws did Joel Embiid shoot? Because he only had 14 points. And if you're guessing they were low, you'd be correct. He got fouled only once this entire game. And knowing, um, now knowing Embiid and like his play style and how he gets a lot of these foul calls like that are that he arguably like shouldn't. Many people would like hear that and like immediately assume that like um, the refs were a bit one sided. Like the fans would immediately assume that because Joel Embiid and these calls they would they're they're ghost content. They're ghost calls some of these times. Like he doesn't even have to get touched to get these calls. The refs have been like it's. But that's that's a whole different topic. I'm not going to elaborate on that. So, like, what happened? But, like, because the Sixers ended up shooting more free throws than the Warriors. So, what happened this game? Were, were the lights too bright for him? Like, I think, like, a big part definitely played in the lack of free throws. Say what you want, but free throws are, like, what help him score. And with the amounts he usually takes, because he takes 12 a game, he would have ended this game with 26 points if he would have taken his regular amount of free throws. So... It's like, obviously he hunts for them, and that kills him a lot because if he doesn't get the foul calls when he just flails his body around for no reason, then he would have just flailed his body around literally for no reason. And because of that, that greatly, like, um, that affects, like, um, that could affect, that could affect the team going deep into the playoffs because, like, he's not hunting to score, so he's hunting to get fouled, so it's like, why is he hunting to get fouled? You shouldn't be hunting for that. Like, that's not something that, sh that should be done whatsoever. Like, you should look to score. Joel only made, like, it was, it was bad. It was really bad for him. Uh, he hunts for them all the time. At the half, the game was really close. But then the flip switch. Joel only made, then this is why I mentioned that the lights might not have been bright, that the lights might have been a little too bright for him. Because the flip switch once the third quarter hit. Joel Embiid only made two shots in that third quarter, scoring five points. Everything else from him was either a foul, a turnover, or a missed shot. It shows that, like, why the mid-range game is, is so frowned upon uh, a lot by analytics and stats people. Because, like, these type of shots that he takes aren't what you traditionally call good shots. They tend to be contested mid-ranges, fadeaway mid-ranges, all types of mid-ranges. It's a very useful tool to have in your bag, but not something that should be used as a crutch on the offensive side of the ball. It gives you the exact same points as a layup, but the shot is much farther. And with the way Embiid plays, he makes the shots a lot more difficult. Obviously, like, he's so good to the point where he's turned that type of shot into a good shot. But for him, when the shot isn't knocking down, it seriously hurts your team. Especially when he takes such a high volume of them. You essentially wasted a possession by throwing the ball up in someone's face while he's, like, contesting you. And you're making the shot ten times more difficult by fading away and being farther away from the basket. Obviously, if you make it, good job. But, you know, it's one of those high risk, low reward type of deals, which is why a lot of teams would rather take two strictly in the paint to ensure that they can score those points or take a three pointer if they have to back up a little bit and the paint isn't there. Uh, what makes it all worse for him is that throughout the game, like it looked like the Sixers, like they played much better basketball as a team without Embiid. Like when he was sitting out of the game, he sat out a majority of the first half of the fourth due to like being in a bunch of foul trouble but before he got subbed out the team was losing 80 to 66 but once that bench came in they started to rally and they started to play they started to share the ball amongst each other they started to play really good team basketball moving the ball playing great defense converting on fouls there was a point where they even flashed a full court press on golden state and it forced a turnover and they also even tried going into two three like the rotations for, for Nick Nurse in this game and the coaching and the game plan, like, he went, he sent everything that he could possibly send on Golden State. It was, I thought it was, I thought it was great, like, how the team was able to, like, rally um, when Embiid, like, was sitting out and they were able to provide very good offense for um, the team and very good defense for the team as well. And... I should mention that this happened, some of this definitely happened while Steph Curry wasn't on the floor. So if they decided to take full advantage of the situation and rally the Warriors, like, they took advantage of the situation right when um, Steph Curry was sitting out. But there was, he wasn't sitting out the entire time, obviously, because he wasn't in foul trouble. But the Warriors ended up calling a timeout in the fourth, and the score was 93 to 90. So the bench 
was able to go on a huge run to end up tie, uh, almost tying the game back up. But then after the timeout, Joel Embiid comes right back into the lineup. And then the game plan completely shifted back to him getting the ball every single possession and running the isolation in the low post. Why? Why Why do you do that? That wasn't working. And like, what you were doing before was working. Stick to the game plan that was working for your team rather than running isolations with Embiid in the low post every single time. I understand like why they did it, like trying to get him going in the fourth quarter because you need your best player to show up in the fourth. Not to mention the idea of Joel having the ball and then him getting doubled, which means someone would be open for a good shot, is generally a good strategy. And can't forget the whole trust the process where it's like, okay, like we might be slow now, but give it a minute, like trust the process, all that stuff. But there comes a time in sports where sometimes your best player doesn't have to be the best player of the night. And and that's okay. Like that's because we're all human. That there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. It's a team sport for a reason. And the team was playing well when they were playing like a team. So that strategy was working. Shifting that strategy while they were going on that run after the timeout completely killed their momentum You want to know what the rest of the possessions were like for the Sixers after that? I'll give you ten of them. Joel Embiid missed a three-pointer. Joel Embiid made a technical free throw making the score 91 to 98. Joel Embiid turnover. Tobias Harris miss. Joel Embiid turnover. Joel Embiid turnover again. This one for this one led to a foul which made the score 91 to 104. Um, House makes his free throws. Oubre makes his layup. Joel Embiid turnover, and then Joel Embiid gets injured. Half of those possessions in the span that I just told you were directly caused by Joel Embiid and his terrible passing and his terrible decision making and his turnovers and his bad shot selection. The team playing better without you is a bit concerning. They've done that in two of the three games since Joel decided to sit. Now, they lost all of those games, but one of those games was against the Denver Nuggets being a great team. They played phenomenally, but obviously, like, the Denver Nuggets, it's, they're the Denver Nuggets. It's really, it's a difficult team to beat. And then they put up a stinker against um, Portland. Like, obviously, I mean, like, you don't, you shouldn't really expect the bench to be that consistent, especially when they're used to, when they were used to a specific play style with giving Joel Embiid the ball every single time. But they, they played well in two of these, in two out of three of these games, in my personal opinion. Then again, the argument could have been like, oh, Joel had a bad night, but this is why ISO heavy lineups who rely on players who like want the ball every single time could backfire. And in games like this, this is where people would rather flock to Jokic's side and, and say that they would rather have Jokic as a center because of these types of situations that Joel was in. Like if Jokic, if you put Jokic on that field and he was getting doubled like how he like how Joel, uh, Joel Embiid was against uh, Golden State. He would have feasted on the assists, in my opinion, because like isolation, while it's difficult to stop on your own, it's also the most difficult offense to run on your own. If the team figures out a way to like slow you down or to stop it, where does the team go next? So do they just keep doing the same thing every time until it doesn't work? Until it works, even though it doesn't work? Like that's literally the definition of insanity. So. They stumbled into that problem with this game, with Joel Embiid being completely off of his game. Like, they should have realized that he was off his game and now wasn't like it was. It was just a bad game for him. But they needed to, they needed to find something else to go to. Some and they did. But then when Joel Embiid went back in, they just went back to what wasn't working, which I just don't understand. But now that I finished about the game, what does this mean for the Sixers? Well. I think Joel Embiid is going to lose the, the is not going to win the MVP. So now to avoid any more scrutiny, he has to make it all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals. The severity of his injury, like we don't know about it yet, but you know, the Sixers might be in trouble with these recent losses. They moved all the way down between the fifth, and uh, it's, it's obviously like that is from jumping down from the third all the way to the fifth is really bad. It's a big problem for Philly. They must. Ha they must have the high seed lock. They, they have to. They absolutely have to have that high seed. If they, if they get into the bottom half of the playoff bracket, then they might face off against much more difficult competition in the first round. And you don't want that as, um, as like a 
if you are Philly, you definitely don't want that because of Joel Embiid and his bugaboos in the postseason. At least in my personal opinion. Like it's very important that Philly can keep trying to win and like they keep winning to keep their uh with the lineup that they have to keep their um record um good enough so that way they can ensure a um a two a three seed at least or maybe even a four seed. They would much prefer to have their three seed so that, that way they can go up against a little bit less of a competition so that way they can make it all the way to the next round. But still, they definitely they definitely don't want to drop all the way down to like eight or like um seven. They do not want that. That is bad news. So far the process um has not been a success for the Sixers. Um but we'll see later. I again we don't know the severity of Joel Embiid's injury. And we are running out of time for this first segment, so I will be right back after the short break where we talk about Stephen Curry and Sabrina Ionescu matching up in the three-point competition for All-Star break. So I'll get back to you. <laughs> 